promotion. You'll not miss your arising. You'll not miss your next step of life and glory. You will so you don't take it for granted that there are people who have lost very great financial opportunities because they were in the wrong place and at the wrong time. There are people who are frustrated in their marriage because they're at the wrong place and at the wrong time. There are actually people who even frustrated their marital destiny. They're in the wrong relationship because at the time when the person who God had ordained for them was available, they were in the wrong place and at the wrong time. There are people who went to the wrong ministries and they were cut and destroyed because they sat under the wrong people. They sat under the wrong teachers and ministers of the gospel. It's endless. If I start talking about it story by story, experience upon experience, I can say that many people have messed up. Some of you are so, have, have, have actually gone back three or four, five years concerning your destiny because you were positioned wrongly in the time of your visitation. It's important for every believer to discern when God visits them for a particular purpose. I'm not saying that he doesn't live in us. No, he lives in us. In him, we live, move, and have our own being. And likewise, he lives in us. When I'm talking about those visitations, I'm talking about divine encounters. The days where God wants to encounter you to elevate you to the next place of glory, it's expedient that you know how to position yourself. For they which know how to position themselves are the ones liable for the success and promotions of the spirit. For promotion, the Bible says, come from neither east nor west, but it comes from God. The Bible says he pulls down one and he sets up the other. Positioning is everything. Positioning is everything. And you must know how to position yourself in the spirit. Today, I want to teach you about seven things that will help you position yourself for success for the fulfillment of the perfect will of God concerning your life. Seven things that I believe are keys, if you'll call them, to help you know how to position yourself in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The first thing, or the first key, understanding your calling and election. Understanding your calling and election. Second Peter, the first chapter, the 10th verse, it says, wherefore, the rather, the Bible says, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, he says, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It says, take all diligence to make your calling and election sure. There are things that you will learn early as you learn to walk with God. Because again, there is a difference between being called of God and being chosen of God. Many of you, many of us are called, but few are chosen. And it's possible to live in the realm of the called until the day you leave this earth. Albeit God wants you by reason of exercising yourselves to design evil and good to grow and mature as you are being taught, as you're being tested, as you continue to die to the things of the world, for you to be positioned among the chosen, because mantles are in the chosen, not the gifted. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so he says, if you're talking about diligence, this is the diligence required of you, that you make your calling and election sure. Know who you are, Ali. Know who you are, Ali. Know what God has called you to be, Ali. I know that it's a working process to transition from the anointing or the gifting on your life into sitting in the office that God has called you. There are testations, there are ways and deals that God works with you to take you there. But while you are on that journey, it's important to know exactly what you are called to do and what you are ordained to walk into. When you know who you are, or what God has placed on your life, even before the glory gets on you, even before the greatness on your life shines through the whole world, you learn to discipline yourself, to chastise your spirit, not to do all go certain places because of what you are or who you are. You learn to make decisions to even go certain places or visit certain experiences because of who you are. Because of who you are. 
There is that which separates you from the man that you're seated next to spiritually. Depending on what God has called you to do. When God was separating me for the work of ministry many years ago, in a visitation and instruction, there are things he warned me never to do. There are things he warned me never to, 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 to indulge myself into. There are places I cannot go. There's a certain kind of experience that I have with him that cannot allow me or give me the liberty to do things which are even lawful. They are not in their own sense sinful. But because I know who I am, there are things I just cannot do. You see what I'm saying? Those are close to my heart. They are personal. And, and I, I prefer not to air them out because I don't want them to become doctrine. Praise God. In 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, a story is given about David. You know very well this man had earned respect and honor. God had greatly anointed him and highly favored him for the course that he had gone. He was a man of war and victories had come left, right, and center. He's come from a great war after de de defeating the Assyrian. And the first verse, 11 chapter, 2 Samuel, it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings, listen, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem in the time when kings go for war. In the time when kings go for war. That means by the calendar, by the chronicles of heaven or of the spirit, there were designated times by God that in these times of human history, in these times of existence, in these windows, in these eons, in these periods, these are the times kings cannot stay home because he was called to be a king. If a man different from David stayed home, even if he was needed as much, because he is not a king, it was not counted to him because he stayed home. But it was counted on a king not to stay home in that period. So the Bible says David goes ahead at the time when kings go for, war, for battle. He stays still at Jerusalem. And then he goes on the rooftop and finds a woman which is bathing. But Sheba. If David was at war, he would not have seen a bathing woman. It wasn't the intention of Bathsheba to tempt the king. Or perhaps if we're to think of it from a logical perspective, Bathsheba did not expect the king to be on that placing, on that position at that particular time. He is not expected to be at the roof at that time because it's expected that he should be at war. You see, positioning. And then he sees a woman, he lasts over her, kills the husband and before we know that judgment has come on the man of God because he positioned himself differently. How did that come to be? He did not know, had not fully understood who he was. He had not yet understood the calling of God upon his life. If he had fully appreciated the calling of God upon his life, he would have left for battle. And then if that by the grace of God had happened, would not have seen that experience. Bathsheba. Somebody shout amen. And so you can't say that for every man who stayed back when David did not go for war. But you can say that for David because it was the time when kings should go for battle. Somebody shout hallelujah. The second key or the second uh, thing that you need to apply yourself to if you seek to position yourself for the success that only God can give, is to cultivate a life of obedience to divine instruction. Cultivating a life of obedience to divine instruction, or instructions, plural. And this is how I want to say it. They are generic instructions in the faith, right? And they are personal instructions in the faith, generically, Thou shall not steal. We're not supposed to steal. That's an instruction. Thou shall not lie. That's an instruction. That's generic. And it's true. You see that? Do not um, produce false witnesses. 
that, 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 that's true. That's generic. There are instructions for every believer. Do not unequally yoke to non-believers. Those are instructions. It's not for kings uh, to, to, to take wine. Those are instructions. Those are generic. They're general. But when you start hearing God, there are instructions that come to you personally. Hallelujah. When God separates you from a mass of people, when God separates you from a crowd or a number, and he puts you alone and says, I want to tell you something that two or three or 4,000 people are not supposed to hear, it means that there is a bigger assignment on your life, and whether you know what it is yet or not, it's important for you to position yourself to the obedience of whatever God is going to tell you, because in defining the realms or the degrees of the presence of God, there is a presence that comes with a particular individual instruction. You see, there is an increase of grace that is available to every believer who has an individual or particular instruction from the rest. You see that? I'll give you an example. Not everybody in the days of Samson needed to keep hair to keep strength. But it was by a Nazarite order that Samson had to keep his hair. That was personal to him. That was the source of his strength. It was the churning of the anointing of God upon his life and the confirmation of the presence of God on his life. Somebody shout hallelujah. So when you learn to cultivate a life of obedience to the instruction, God told him simple, no man shall shed a hair of your head. That was a clear instruction. He told a woman he was not supposed to tell the secret of his strength. And a man's positioning in the spirit changed. It so changed that he died a death he was not supposed to die. He lost his vision. We all know that story. And we hear the man of God pray, May I die with the Philistines. May I die with the Philistines. May I die. I wish he prayed, May I kill them and stay alive. But I feel in my heart that the man of God had lost that interest of being alive. The disappointment in his heart for being betrayed by the woman he loved. The frustration of that potential in him of feeling that what was inside him was not given the opportunity to live the life that he had to live. Samson died at a very young age. Am I making sense? But it is because... He had not understood what it means to carry obedience for the personal instructions that God will give you. And I have emphasized this earlier, that usually those personal instructions define a certain degree of the presence of God on your life. Let me show you two people who actually disconnected themselves from an instruction and the very presence of God. One is Cain. Remember the story of those two boys, Cain and Abel. Huh? First example of worship in scripture. And so they all come and Cain gives an offering to God and Abel gives an offering to God. But the Bible says, but the way Abel gave his offering, the way Abel positioned himself in the offering, he gave the firstling of his flock. And the Bible says, and the Lord had respect unto the offering of Abel. But the Bible says, but he did not have respect unto the offering of Cain. Now the merciful God we know comes to Cain in the fifth chapter. Let's go back to the fifth chapter. But unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Now listen to this. God instructs this man. Listen to that instruction. He tells him, look, the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou dost well, if you do well, if you do well, if you do well, this is not a personal instruction, you shall be accepted. And if thou doest, doest not well, the Bible says, sin liest at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. That was the time this man was going to go back into his substance and do well. 
come back and give an offering to God and is accepted before God. The instruction was clear. You are wroth for nothing. You are angry for nothing. If you do well, I will accept your offering too. You have not offered the way you're supposed to offer. Offer the right way and I will accept your gift. But if you do not sin, lieth at the door and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. Next verse, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that he rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. He slew him. Why did he kill him? God had given him a way out to perfect his praise and worship. But he did not even respect that God had given him a personal instruction to bail himself out. He goes ahead and gets anger toward a man who knew how to worship God and he slays him. He slays him. He slays him. God tells him, what have you done? Where is your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? He says, no, there's blood, ble there's blood right there. The ass has opened its mouth. It has swallowed Innocent blood. That blood spoke up to the New Testament. The Bible says up till today, the blood of Abel still speaks. But what does the blood of Abel speak? Beyond vengeance. Because some people think the blood of Abel speaks only concerning vengeance. No, it has an instruction there. It has an instruction there. In fact, if you study the blood of Abel well, you learn how to worship right. Because Abel was a worshiper. Abel was skilled for being a true worshiper. But number two also, for the reader of scripture, there's a lesson also on why is it that Cain could not conceive the instruction given him to do right and he found it easier to slay his own blood. He found it easier to slay his own blood. It goes back to what he saw concerning the victory and grace operating on Abel's life. This was not about what he could do to get right. I believe there's something this boy saw on Abel's life. And it's, if, you, if, you, if you read the story, the whole story of the Bible, you understand it's these two things. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the tree of life. It goes through. It's the Cain, Abel. It's the Ephraim, Manasseh. It's the Jacob, and Esau. It's, it's, it's the Isaac and Ishmael. It goes through New Testament, Old Testament, First Adam, Second Adam, and Jesus. It, 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 it's deeper than that. But there's something on Cain that chooses the harder road of slaying his brother than doing what is right before God. This instruction, God by his grace came to him personally and told him what to do and he chose another way. Somebody shout amen. And if you go to the 14th verse again of the same chapter, the Bible says Cain went out from the presence of the Lord because he distanced himself from the instruction of God. That, that, took him out of the presence of God. He came with a certain presence. Somebody shout hallelujah. Similar story of a man called Jonah. The son of Amittai. The Lord appears to him in Jonah, the first chapter, first verse. It comes to him saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But, the Bible says, Jonah rose up and fled to, and to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He fled to Tashish from the presence of the Lord. What was the presence of the Lord? The instruction of the Lord had a certain presence. And for him to go to Nineveh, as God has instructed him as a prophet, was to go with a certain presence. Him refusing to obey the instruction of God disconnected him from a certain presence. And the Bible says he fled from the presence of God and found a sheep and two Tashish. He even paid the fare thereof. And he went down uh, from the presence of God. You see, God didn't chase him out. But certain instructions come with a certain degree of presence. I have a sermon there called the degrees of the presence of God. Look for it. You'll love it. It will show you how to function in higher realms of God's presence. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. So the question is, are you disciplined? To receive instruction, especially that which is personal. 
Because that defines the level and grace of the presence of God operating on your life. And with that presence is the position. Somebody shout amen. The third key or principle or thing that you need to do uh, to position yourself for success. Be attuned to the timing or timings of the spirit. Be attuned to the timing or the timings of the spirit. In John, the gospel of John, the fifth chapter, the second verse, at Jerusalem by the sheep market, the Bible speaks of a pool called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda. It had five porches. And in these lay great multitudes of imported folk, of blind, of halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. So he speaks of an angel that went down a sudden season unto the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in, that individual was made whole from the disease that diseased him. Now, there was a certain man in scripture, that man had an infirmity for 38 years. And for 38 years long, that man sat at that pool, waiting to fall in the water when the angel comes to stir the water. And Jesus saw this man lying at the pool, and he knew he had been there for a long time. So he comes to this man and said unto him, will you be made whole? And the man in his mindset says, you know what? I have no man that when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming in, another steppeth down before me. Another person goes in before me. Why? Because he did not know how to time. He did not know how to time. 38 years at a pool of healing. 38 years. 38 years. This man is on the pool. And he does not know how to time himself into the going in. For 38 years. We don't know how many times it was done. Or was it once a year? I don't know. But wherever the time of the angel came through. Every time that opportunity. If it was a year. Then it's 38 years of missing out his miracle. Because he doesn't know how to position himself at the time when the angel should fall in. So the question is, how about the people who fell in? What did they used to do right? They knew how to design the time. Somebody shout hallelujah. They knew how to design the time. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. That means there's an accorded deal. A period of time that is available for you. And those are the windows of the spirit. When Jesus tells this man that... I'm going to heal you. And he heals him before the angelic comes to stir the water. Jesus has created another window by revelation wherewith a man can get the miracle. But it's still subject to the power and realm of time. Because even that miracle happened in a certain time period of Jesus Christ's chronology. Somebody shout hallelujah. What the mystery of the new birth gives us what the revelation of the New Testament dispensation gives us is to know how to arrest our own timings for the miracle that we need is to know how to seize and create our own seasons, our own eons, our own periods in time, least at any time. The Bible says they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and be converted with their heart and that I should heal them. We, what we're given in the New Testament is the ability to save time. Wherewith we don't wait on the chronology of men to deal with the things of our need. No, we are subject to the kairos, which is of God, the appointed times of God. And those are not waiting themselves according to the patterns of chronological uh, sequences in human existence. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He's not subject to that our time series. No, 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 no. Revelation is the key for access to the redemption of time. For as long as your eyes can see, as long as your ears can hear, as long as it can get into your heart, he says, for the revealed things belong unto us and our children. You see that? The difference here is, it helps you redeem time even quicker. It helps you know how to utilize, how to take advantage 
of the spirit of revelation available for you for the redemption of a time. So in the time when you need a thing, it is available for you. In fact, the responsibility of the New Testament believer is to redeem the time for the days are evil. He says, walk as wise men, not as unwise men. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. You have to see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. He said, it's a foolish thing not to know how to redeem time or not to know how to get what you want when you need it. If you are aligned to the perfect will of God concerning your life. And oh yes, that disturbs people who are who understand God the wrong way. Jesus would not have said, list at any time. List. He, he knew what he was saying. Jesus knew what he was saying. He says, these people's uh, hearts uh, is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have closed. And he says, list at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should, not might, not could, not shall, should be converted and I should heal them. I, I have no choice. I have to heal them because I need their conversion first. And that conversion comes from the place where their heart uh, conceives right, their eyes see right, and their ears start to hear. If that is availed, any time, any time, it's not according to my time. It's according to their availability to me. Somebody shout Hallelujah. If they can connect to the right revelation, I should heal them. Do you realize that you're just one revelation away from your next miracle? One revelation away from your next miracle. One revelation away from your next miracle. You are suffering because something has not been revealed to your spirit yet. Yes, your mind could have an assent to it. But that I mean that your spirit has the experience of it. You're just one revelation away. To your next miracle. Can you think about that? So, if you want to learn how to position yourself for success, be attuned to the timings of the Spirit because the timings of God evolve around the Spirit of Revelation. If you understood it, shout Amen. Somebody shout Hallelujah. The fourth thing, avoid the company of men who have no fear of God. Avoid the company of men who have no fear of God. Avoid the company of people who set themselves against truth. Avoid it. Avoid it. I, I cannot tell you how in my walk of salvation, I have seen people whose lives have been destroyed because of a wrong friend. Whose destinies have been frustrated because of the wrong counsel. Whose directions have been turned to destruction because of the wrong people in their lives. Somebody was in the right church learning the gospel. And a foolish slanderous woman came and became friends with them. And that foolish woman started dissuading this individual from the truth. And this person left the church and the presence where God had appointed them to grow. And three, four, five years later, they have made decisions that they might or should or could not have made if they sat on the right teacher. Either in their marital destiny or in their career or in their personal ministry concerning their lives. And now they've damaged the next 10, 20, 50 years because they sat with the wrong person over tea. How many people right now are dealing with disease in their bodies because they related to the wrong people? How many people have lost their jobs because they related to the wrong people? How many people are depressed and are now suffering with, with bipolar and, 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 and manic depression because they related with the wrong people? How many businesses are destroyed because people partnered with the wrong people? How many people's ministries have been brought under because they related with the wrong people? How many people's reputations have been ruined because they related with ungodly people? He says, bad company corrupts good morals. Be not deceived, he says. Bad company corrupts good morals. A man's destiny can change to destruction because of one individual. I know people who have walked out of the perfect will of God because they sat over a drink with the wrong person. As sad as that can be. So if you want to be successful, position yourself for success. And in the positioning of yourself for success, know who to eat with. 
Jesus says, know how not to eat with certain individuals. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible speaks of how they which hang with the wicked shall be destroyed with the wicked. Sometimes judgment does not come on a man because they are bad. Sometimes judgment comes on a man because when God sent judgment on the wicked, the man was in the dwelling of the wicked. The fifth point or key, be available to God. Be available to God. And what do I mean to be available? If you'll add a dash there. Be a consistent and persistent seeker. Let me tell you the secret about being a persistent and, and consistent seeker. The consistent and persistent seeker has the ability of tapping into assignments that are not necessarily exclusively availed for them in the first place. Did you hear that? When a man is a consistent seeker, when a man is a persistent seeker, he avails himself for assignments that are not even originally exclusive for them. That means you are synchronized in the spirit for any good thing to be done through you by God. Through you by God. And sometimes the plans God has are for particular individuals. And some of, those, some of those individuals don't necessarily go or walk into what God has called them to be. But when you learn to be a consistent and a persistent seeker, you're able to design and pick the need of heaven and avail yourself when a man, even where you were not originally called for, and God can give you that assignment in spite of the fact that it was for another man before. Like I've already said, the giftings and callings of God are without repentance, but the assignment of God can change even though he has chosen an exclusive vessel. If that vessel says no, God will still look for the available. But a man has to know how to be available. And to be available is to be consistent and persistent in the seeking. Look at the story of Isaiah. In the time, the sixth chapter, when God is planning to send people, a particular individual, in that time of Isaiah, he had not specifically zeroed on calling Isaiah. No. He, the Elohim, was having a conversation in heaven. And he said, whom shall we send? Verse 8, the 6th chapter. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, Lord, send me. Isaiah was not God's exclusive vessel. Otherwise, God would not raise, uh, waste his time asking whom to send. If Isaiah was available, you think he did not know that Isaiah had ascended into those heights? No, he knew the man had, had transcended into the place where he was hearing that conversation. But if Isaiah just kept quiet when God said, whom shall we send? That conversation would have ended. And one time Isaiah would see a man doing that which God was conversating over to send for. And he would not be in that rhythm. But he chose and said, send me Lord. That kind of appointment was not exclusive. It was all inclusive for the man which is available at that hour. Look at Cornelius in Acts the 10th chapter. Remember Cornelius, that Italian fellow. The Bible says he opened, he was the first door to the Gentile church. The Bible doesn't say that God had ordained Cornelius to be the first door of the gospel to the Gentile. No. But it found a man, the Bible says in verse 1. At Caesarea, if you read the Amplified Bible, living at Caesarea, there was a man whose name was Cornelius, a centurion, a captain of what was known as the Italian regiment, a devout man who venerated God and treated him with reverential obedience, as did all his household, and he gave much alms to the people and prayed continually to God. And I'm going to come later to the alms a bit. But this was, I want to emphasize this, this was a diligent and consistent seeker. He venerated God and treated him with reverential obedience. He was available to God. And the Bible says he sought and prayed to God continually. Somebody shout amen. Continually. And about the ninth hour of the day he saw in a clear vision an angel of the Lord entering and saying to him, Cornelius, and he gazingly and intently looked at him, and behold, 
he became frightened and he says, what is it, Lord? And the angel said, your prayers, your prayers, your prayers, and your generous gifts to the poor have come up to God as a sacrifice and God has remembered them. Your prayers have been remembered. And now we see if we read the story, God appears to Peter as well in Joppa and shows him of fellows coming to seek for him as he sees a sheet of all four-legged animals. Kill and eat, kill and eat. I shall not eat that which is uncommon and unhallowed or ceremonially clean. And God tells him, how can you call unclean that which I have purified? And then God tells Peter, go to the house of Cornelius. Long story short, as he is preaching the gospel, before he makes them confess anything, the Bible says, while he yet spake, the spirit of the Lord fell on the house of Cornelius. Somebody shout hallelujah. And he makes a very, very powerful statement in the 34th verse. Peter opens his mouth after he has seen what God has done and said, over truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. That means the fear of God, the working of righteousness, the seeking of the face of the Father, positions yourself for a certain acceptation. He's saying, if you know how to seek me, if you know how to position yourself, if you know how to pray in the time when I need you to pray, if you know how to be consistently and persistently a seeker, I am no respecter of persons. I can skip any man and put it on you. I can put it on you. So Cornelius becomes the first door of the gospel to the houses Oh, the Gentile. Not because it was originally God's plan, but there was a man who knew how to seek God. Somebody shout hallelujah. The sixth key or point is connected partly to the uh, portion of scripture before. Be a spirit-led giver. Be a spirit-led giver. You see, when we're talking about giving, we're not just talking about giving money. Okay, money is one of your time, your gifts, your talent, your abilities, your potentials, your wisdoms, whatever God has bestowed on you for advantage. Be a spirit led giver. Learn to add more to men with what God has given you. If it's substance, it's all right. Or whatever it is, learn to be a spirit led giver. In the gospel, we see men which position themselves for miracles simply because they were spirit-led givers. They were just givers. They were just good givers. And I emphasize spirit-led because there's a new creation. You must lead, be led by the spirit, not emotion, not manipulation. You see? The Bible speaks of a centurion in Luke, the seventh chapter, which had a sick servant. In fact, there are two places where we see the great faith, great faith in scripture. And great faith in scripture is all seen on Gentiles. You see? On Gentiles. But one of them here is the famous Roman centurion. Verses 1. When he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Copernau. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews beseeching him that he would come and heal his servants. Now listen, when they came to Jesus, when these people come to Jesus, they besought him instantly saying that he was worthy of whom he should do this for. That this man was worthy. He had positioned himself for that miracle. And listen what they say. For he loved our nation and hath built us a synagogue. This guy has a sick servant. He's worthy for you to do the miracle. Yes, he's a Roman centurion. We don't know so much about his faith. But he built us a synagogue. How can you ignore this fellow? Learn to be a big giver to God. Because giving positions you. And as we know it, if you read the story very well, when Jesus approaches the man, the man says, you know what, I'm unworthy. I'm a man under authority. When I tell my servants or the army, do this, go here, they go, come up with it and they come. 
He says, you just send a word and I know that my servant shall be healed. And Jesus sent a word and the servant of the centurion was healed. He says, I have not seen such great faith. Not in Israel. Not in Israel. Not in those which are choice by God. But great faith, great faith was of that same man. You see, he was a giver. Because giving is actually faith. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. If I will add you another story, there's a woman in the book of Acts called Tabitha, or which was known as Dorcas. In the 36th verse, the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, there was a Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. And this woman was full of good works and alms deed, which she did. She was full of good works and alms deed, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in the upper chamber. And for as much as Leda was nigh to uh, Joppa, and the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him with two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come. And when Peter arose and went in with them, when he was come, he brought him into the upper chamber, and all the windows stood by him weeping. All the widows, sorry, stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas had made. She made us clothes. She was a giver. She was a generous woman. And the Bible says, and Peter put them all forth, knelt down and prayed, turning him to the body. He said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. If Tabitha was not a giver, she would not have called the attention of certain individuals. That does not mean that without giving, we don't pray for the sick. And some men of God have gone a bit overboard. That's wrong. The giftings, the anointing, the healing of God is freely given. And we freely give it. So it doesn't mean that if somebody doesn't give to you, you don't pray. I pray for everybody, however poor they are. But I also need to emphasize that sometimes your seed positions you. It positions you. Somebody shout amen. The servants. He tells you, utilize the power of meditation. Why? Because meditation is a creative force. You can never learn to create in the world of men without meditations. And remember, for all of these seven points I've given, I would need perhaps an hour and a half or two to express my convictions and revelations concerning them. And some of these one day in the bits as I'm led by the Holy Spirit, I will emphasize some of these things for you to go a bit deeper in understanding them, especially on the power of meditation, because many believers do not know how to meditate. Paul tells Timothy, Meditate upon these things and give yourself wholly to them that thy profiting might appear unto them. Let me say, unto all. Let me say it this way. If you do not know how to meditate according to the pattern of the word, then you do not know how to create. And if you do not know how to create, then you cannot manifest when you want to manifest. Because the law of manifestation is subject to the law of creation. And the law of creation is the mystery of meditation. Learn how to meditate in the word of God. Because meditations position you spiritually. Do you realize, if you can go back to the story of uh, Cornelius and Peter, that it was at the point where Peter gets a vision of all these animals, which he calls unclean and unhallowed. And God tells him, you cannot call unclean that which I have called clean and sanctified. The Bible doesn't say that then Peter went to sleep. No, the Bible says, and he pondered on that vision. He took time to meditate through it. And the Bible says, and while Peter pondered on the vision, the spirit said, while Peter pondered on this vision, one version calls it pondering. While Peter pondered on this vision, the Spirit of God spoke to him. There are men sent from Cornelius. If he had not taken time to ponder, he would have had a very obscure experience at the appearance of men on his door. But you will hear God more when you learn to meditate. God speaks more intimately when you learn to meditate. And 
You can never learn how to meditate if you have not learned how to be silent in the presence of God. You know, there are people when they sit in the presence of God, they just talk and talk and talk and talk and weep and wail for three, four, five hours, and then they go to sleep. Then the next day they talk and wail and scream and, and confess, and all of that is okay. But there is a time of meditating in the presence of God. Did you know that as you're speaking in tongues, the Bible says that he that speaketh in tongues buildeth himself up in the Lord. When you are building yourself up as an edifice for God, to what end is that building? The end of that building is to be available to hear God. Because the word of God makes the difference. Somebody shout hallelujah. Some people speak in tongues until they get in that zone. And when they get in that zone, when God is going to speak, they go to sleep. You read in the book of Psalms of Men, he says, in my night watchings on my, on my bed, I meditate on thee, oh God. These men were meditating on their beds at night. They were meditating during the day. You see, when, when Isaac meets uh, Rebecca, the Bible says he had walked out in the evening to go and meditate. Because it was the way of the patriarchs to meditate. They had time with God. And so Isaac goes out in the evenings as he usually used to do. He goes out in the evenings to meditate. And that's how he sees Rebecca coming. You see? But we should not lose the point that he had gone in the field to meditate. Genesis 24, 63. You must have a personal time where you're not just going to speak before God, but you're going to hear. And you cannot hear God if you do not learn to meditate. Because part of your meditation is to position yourself to hear God. To see by God. To create images as the voice of God comes. Because when the voice of God comes, it helps you to create I'll have a summon on that one day and just share with you deeply on how to meditate right. When you learn to meditate, you'll be amazed that the first thing that will happen to you, you'll start to realize that you're always attuned to everything that happens in your life spiritually. God will start to set you lips ahead of many things. So you come back for them and align and position things. For your good. For all things work together for good. For them that love the Lord. And are called according to his purposes. I could speak forever. But I run out of time. And I believe that the faithful here. Has received what you're supposed to receive tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We are entering into a time of human history. Where we cannot be with excuse anymore. To show forth the praises of him. Who called us out of darkness. And to his marvelous light. And these things are important for anybody that wants to live a successful life in the ministry and life of the gospel.